Welcome back, everyone. This is Dr. Gallenstein, and we are here again with lecture number 15. Now, lecture 15 is going to be the last lecture in the class, so well done. You've made it a long way. Today's lecture is going to go over a topic or a method called regression discontinuity. This is the last method that we're going over. It's another one of these quasi-experimental methods that allow us to identify causation even when we don't have the luxury of randomization. So with that introduction, let's jump right in. So regression discontinuity is a powerful regression method that allows us to identify causation by controlling for observables and unobservables. You might remember from the past methods that we've looked at, for example, propensity score matching, that some methods aren't as powerful as others. Some methods only allow us to control for observables, for example, uh, as in propensity score matching. But regression discontinuity is one of the more powerful methods because it allows us to control for observables and unobservables. Now what regression discontinuity allows us to do is mimic randomization in a very specific context. So what it does is it allows us to identify causality by taking advantage of an arbitrarily set eligibility threshold. Okay, I'm going to go more into that into detail in just a moment. When we take it, but what we're going to do is take advantage of an arbitrarily set eligibility threshold and in order to mimic randomization. Okay. So regression discontinuity can be used when an intervention is not randomly assigned, but there is some eligibility criteria for who can access or use the intervention. Okay, so just to reiterate, regression discontinuity is a method that we can use when there is some program or, or policy that's implemented and there is some eligibility criteria that determines who can gain access to that program or who is affected by that policy. Okay? And so the researcher, so regression discontinuity allows the researcher to identify causation based on the following logic. Okay? So here's the basic logic. Okay. That when an eligibility criteria is defined on a continuous variable, that eligibility criteria is somewhat arbitrary. Let me explain. So here's a very important point. Regression discontinuity can be used when access to a program or, or uh, being affected by a policy is determined by some eligibility criteria. And that eligibility criteria has to be defined on a continuous variable. Okay. And when it's defined on a continuous variable, that criteria is somewhat arbitrary. Let me give an example. Imagine that, that, uh, that the government's putting in place some program that provides households with uh, an unconditional cash transfer if they make less than a certain amount of money per year. So let's say the government is going to give an unconditional cash transfer to, to any household that makes less than $50,000 a year. There's, there's, there's an, uh, an example. Now, in this context, there is some eligibility criteria. The eligibility criteria is $50,000 of income. Now, that criteria is defined on a continuous variable. That continuous variable is uh, income. So income is a continuous variable, and then there's some criteria, $50,000, that determines who accesses the program and who doesn't. So if we want to identify the impact of this cash transfer program, we can take advantage of the fact that that eligibility criteria, defined on a continuous variable, is somewhat arbitrary. Now, what do I mean by saying that it's arbitrary? I mean that when an eligibility criteria is defined on a continuous variable, that criteria is, uh, well, just using the word again, it's arbitrary. What I mean is that using our example of income, setting the threshold at 50,000 is arbitrary as compared to, you know, why not 51,000 or 49,000 or 48,000? If I set the eligibility criteria at 50,000, there are going to be some people who make just a little bit more than 50,000, maybe 51,000. And there's going to be other people that make just a little bit less, 59, uh, 49,000. And this, so this $50,000 threshold, it kind of just cuts arbitrarily through this continuous variable. 
And so, so that is the first point, the first logic, and then moving to the second lot, the second point of logic here is that those who are just eligible will be very similar to those who are just ineligible. So what do I mean by that? So if we set this threshold at $50,000, because it's just arbitrarily placed along a continuous variable, we would expect that those people that so happen to make $51,000 are probably quite similar to those who so happen to make $49,000. They're very close to the threshold. And yet the person that makes $49,000 receives the program and the person that makes $51,000 does not. And so what this does is it creates this situation where close to the cutoff, close to the edge of eligibility criteria, the population, so the population of people close to the eligibility criteria are quite similar above and below that cutoff, that eligibility um, criteria. So those who make $51,000 and those that make $49,000 are, are probably quite similar, if not totally comparable. And so what this does is it mimics randomization because there's a certain degree of comparability between the samples of people that fall just above and those that fall just below that arbitrarily set eligibility criteria. And that gives us our intuition. That gives us our logic. What is happening here is that this arbitrarily set eligibility criteria defined on a continuous variable creates a situation in which we have a group of people that is, uh, we have a group, we have two groups of people that are comparable. Okay, so when an intervention is made available based on some threshold of an observable characteristic, an observable, observable continuous characteristic, we can estimate the causal impact by comparing outcomes just above and just below that threshold. So here's another example. Imagine that there's a program offering microfinance loans to, to small farmers. And, but this program of offering microfinance loans is really, it's, it's, the intention of the program is, is really meant to uh, help farmers who are lower income, lower wealth farmers. And so they set a threshold. They say these pro this program, these loans are only available to, to farmers that own less than 10 acres of land. Well, how much land a farmer owns is a continuous variable. They might own between zero and, you know, infinity in a certain sense, or a very large number. So it's a continuous variable how much land they own. And yet we have an, a, re, a somewhat arbitrarily set threshold, 10 acres of land. So there will be some farmers that have 10 and a half acres of land and some farmers that have nine and a half acres of land. And so what this does is it is, is it is quite reasonable to think that those who have just a little bit more than 10 acres are quite similar to those that have just a little bit less than 10 acres. And so we can identify the treatment effect of these microfinance loans by comparing households just over and those just under that 10 acre threshold. So it's mimicking randomization. It's mimicking an experiment. It's one of the quasi experimental methods. Okay, so regression discontinuity can only work when an intervention is made available based on some eligibility criteria defined over some continuous variable. So let me introduce some terms to make this a little bit more concrete. So first term I'll use is eligibility, vari eligibility variable. Now it's given different names in different contexts. So for example, selection variable or running variable are both um, uh, names that it's been given. I've also seen it called the rating variable. So there's lots of different names. I like to call it the eligibility variable. This eligibility variable is some continuous variable that is used to evaluate an individual's eligibility for the intervention. So in this lecture, I'll use the, the letter S to refer to the eligibility variable. Okay, the next is an eligibility threshold or criteria. This is some threshold value of the eligibility variable that defines eligibility. Those above or below, depending on the context, uh, those above or below this threshold will have access while the others do not. So I'm gonna represent this by the value S star. So S star is a specific value of the variable S. Now let's give some further um, intuition here. 
So here I have a, uh, a graph. Uh, it's, it's a scatter plot. So it's, it's plotting um, a bunch of values of some outcome variable y um, on the y-axis versus the eligibility variable, which I use the letter s for. So it uses this, uh, the eligibility, eligibility variable on the x-axis. Okay, So it's a scatter plot showing all the different values in some data set. And what we can see is that there is, uh, that there is some relationship between the outcome variable y and the eligibility variable s. And now what I've done here is I've just put a line at s star, it's some s star, some value of the variable s. And what I've shown here, what I'm showing here, is that this cutoff occurs somewhere along this distribution of the data, and it is somewhat arbitrary. It could, it, it could be right where it is. I could have it a little bit to the right. I could have it a little bit to the left. But the point is, is that it's cutting through um, a continuous variable. It's cutting through um, a distribution of the data. Um, at, a some, at a fairly arbitrary point. There's some people quite close to it. There's some people that are quite far away from this cutoff. Uh, and so it's somewhat arbitrary. I could move it to the right. I could move it to the left. And it, again, would just be cutting this population um, at an arbitrary place um, in the data. And now we can take advantage of that in order to identify causation. So let's imagine a scenario where... Um, where this is this so let me come up with a with an example here let's say that the outcome variable y is um is some measurement of disease burden it's some measurement of so it's a it's a health outcome variable let's say it's the number of days that someone in your household uh was too sick to work okay and let's say that s this eligibility variable is how far away your household lives from a major city and so we might, accept, we might expect a relationship like this, where those that live closer to a major city, they have easier access to doctors and easier access to medicine. Uh, and so they spend fewer days uh, too sick to work, while those that live farther away, um, they spend more days sick at work. Okay, so, so let's just say that that's our example here. Now, we, let's say we want to put in place a program um, that will uh, reduce the number of sick days. Uh, and so we say, well, we will install, we will open a health clinic in villages that are located more than 50 kilometers away from, uh, from a major city. Okay, so if we want to do that, uh, we are setting some arbitrary cutoff. Why 50 kilometers? Why not 51 kilometers or 49 kilometers or 48 kilometers? Like this 50, it's a nice, you know, right, nice round number. So it, it seems to make sense, but really it's arbitrary. And so let's say we put in place that program. Now, this might be what we expect in our data before the intervention goes into place. But once the intervention goes into place and we collect data after the program was implemented, we might expect to see something like this. Where all of a sudden, the values above the cutoff come down because now all those people have access to a, uh, to a health clinic, whereas those right below the cutoff do not. And so what we see here is that there is, we, we maintain uh, what we notice here as a, you know, a, a consistent linear relationship between Y and S. We maintain that, but the implementation of the intervention has shifted down those who received it, those above the cutoff. And so what you can see is at the cutoff, there is a sharp, uh, or I should say, right at the cutoff, there is a discontinuity at the cutoff. At the cutoff, there is a discontinuity in the relationship between Y and S. And that discontinuity allows us to observe or measure the impact of the intervention. In, effect, in, in fact, because those who are right above the threshold and those that are right below the threshold are otherwise quite similar, we can say that the discontinuity at the cutoff is a measurement of the impact of the intervention. 
And so what we're doing here is, is, is we're saying that, okay, there is some relationship between Y and S, but then once the, once the intervention is put into place based on this eligibility criteria, even though the same basic relationship holds, that is there's still a, the, the same kind of general linear relationship, there is now a discontinuity in that relationship at the cutoff. And that discontinuity allows us to measure the impact. That discontinuity at that cutoff is a measurement of the impact of the program. Okay, and hence the name regression discontinuity. So if we tried to fit a regression line to this set of data, we would fit a nice linear regression line. If we tried to fit a, a, a regression line to this data, we would find that there is some discontinuity in that regression at the cutoff. So that's the idea, regression discontinuity. We're using the discontinuity that occurs at the arbitrarily set cutoff as a way of identifying the impact of the intervention. Okay, so in practice, what we need to do uh, to use this variable uh, or use this method is we need to identify a variable that determines eligibility to receive the intervention. We'll call that variable S. Uh, we need to identify the eligibility cutoff or threshold, uh, S star, and then compare units slightly above or slightly below S star. We could do that. Um, we could do that by hand, or we could do that in a regression framework, which I'll show you a little bit more in a moment. Moreover, when we use regression discontinuity, there are two, um, two versions of it, so to speak. One is called sharp regression discontinuity, and the other is called fuzzy regression discontinuity. As I proceed throughout the lecture, I will show the difference between sharp and fuzzy regression discontinuity, uh, as well as showing how we can implement this practice in a regression framework. Okay. But now first, before I get to those things, I want to take one quick step back. And I want to put this again into the context um, uh, that we've been going through in all these methods. So for every method that we have used in this class, uh, there is always, um, there's always a few things we need to consider. One thing we need to consider is, um, is this method going to be valid for identifying uh, the causal impact uh, in my particular context? Okay, so we always need to ask ourselves whether or not a particular method is suitable, is a suitable approach in our context. So we always have to do that. Then we always need to acknowledge what are the assumptions of the method, and then we need to validate those assumptions. So across the board, in all the methods that we look at, all the methods that we look at, we always have to ask ourselves, what are the assumptions of that method? And do the assumptions of that method hold in our context? So before getting into the details of the regression, we need to, uh, we need to pause and ask ourselves these questions. We have to ask, uh, in what context is regression discontinuity a suitable approach? And then what are the assumptions of the regression discontinuity method? And how do we validate the assumptions of the regression discontinuity method? Once we have those things in place, then we can proceed to implementing the analysis. So let's do those. So first, regression discontinuity, I'll say diagnostic. We ask ourselves the question, is regression discontinuity a suitable approach in our context? Well, we've already alluded to that somewhat uh, so far. We've, we've, we've recognized that regression discontinuity is a, is a potential method only when we have uh, a program that's being implemented and it's being implemented based on some eligibility criteria that is defined on a continuous variable. Okay, so if that is the case, that at least tells us that regression discontinuity might be a suitable approach. In fact, if we are ever in a context where we notice that that is the case, it should go off in our, it should go off in our minds, oh, regression discontinuity is a method we might be able to use here. Okay. But now let's say we're in that case. Let's say that we have that scenario. We, have, we wanna measure the impact of a program and it's, imp it's implemented based on some eligibility criteria. Um, and that eligibility criteria is defined on a continuous variable. Okay, so let's say we're in that context. The next thing that I would do, 
is I would do a quick diagnostic, a quick look at the data to see if we can recognize or if we observe any um, discontinuities in the outcome variable at the eligibility uh, cutoff, at that cutoff point. So what I would do is I would just produce a simple scatter plot of the outcome variable versus the eligibility variable. And I would look for a discontinuity at that eligibility cutoff. If I can see, if I, if I can look at the data and see a, a, a discontinuity there, that would, give, that would be a great indication that this would be a good method. If I don't see uh, a discontinuity at that eligibility cutoff, well, I might keep going. Um, I might keep going to see what I can find because sometimes, sometimes it is hard to, uh, to notice discontinuities in a scatter plot. Um, and so I might keep going, but I, I might also be a little bit cautious in the sense that uh, I might not be able to find um, uh, an effect um, using this method. So, um, so that would be the kind of the, my first step is I would just do a quick, a quick diagnostic to see if I think that this method will be suitable to the context. Okay, now with that in place, let's talk about those assumptions. For the regression discontinuity method, there are two assumptions. One is called the continuity assumption. The other is called the no sorting across the cutoff assumption. Okay, so first one, continuity assumption. The continuity assumption says that all other observable variables are continuous at the cutoff. What do I mean by that? So we have this basic idea. Uh, in fact, I might even, I'll just, uh, let me go back up here. Looking at this, at, this, uh, at this figure, what we see is that there is, a, there is a, a relationship between y and s, and that relationship is consistent across the, across the values of s. So in this case, it's a linear relationship, uh, is that the, y, the, the variable y tends to go up as s goes up. Okay, so you can see that there's a consistent relationship between y and s. When you look at this figure, there's no discontinuity at s star. There's no discontinuity at the cutoff. Whereas here, there is a clear discontinuity. There's a jump in, uh, in the data at the cutoff point. Okay, so what this assumption is saying is that all other variables, that is, variables other than the outcome variable, all other variables are continuous at the cutoff. Okay, so all other variables, all other um, observable continuous variables are continuous at the cutoff. That means that when this program is being implemented, um, when this, so going back to the income example, uh, where we're giving a cash transfer to the, for those that have less than $50,000 a year of income, uh, what we're saying is that is that this fifty thousand dollar cutoff really is arbitrary. There isn't some discontinuity at that cutoff for other variables. So this is a very important assumption. The continuity assumption is saying it's basically a way of saying that that cutoff point is arbitrary. It is arbitrary. It's not that there are a bunch. Uh, it's not that this fifty thousand dollars was picked because there, because fifty thousand dollars a year is a number that makes a big difference between people groups. Okay, what we're saying is that that fifty thousand dollar a year income, that eligibility cutoff, has to be arbitrary. That means people above it and below it have to be reasonably similar, and so we can validate that uh, by looking at other observable variables and confirming that they are continuous at the cutoff, because that implies that uh, people above and below the cutoff really are quite similar. It implies that this cutoff is arbitrary. If continuous variables are not, um, if they're not continuous at the cutoff, that means that, that, this, that this cutoff might not be arbitrary, and it would suggest that uh, the method um, might not be valid or wouldn't be valid. Okay, so that's the con continuity assumption. The second assumption is the no sorting across the cutoff assumption. Um, what this assumption is saying 
is it's assuming that people are not choosing where they fall with respect to their own eligibility. So what does this say? So using this income example, um, we're saying that fifty thousand dollars a year that's this eligibility cutoff and what this is some what what we need to assume so the second assumption the second assumption is that people aren't choosing whether they are eligible or not you don't have anyone saying well hey don't give me a raise because i need to make sure that i'm eligible so you don't have people saying people who make forty nine thousand dollars a year saying hey please don't don't give me a raise because i don't want to go above that fifty thousand dollar threshold you don't have people that make $51,000 a year going to their bosses and saying, hey, can you please cut my pay down to below 50000 so that I become eligible? Okay. Assumption number two is that that is not happening. There's no sorting across the cutoff. People are not intentionally choosing uh, to – they're not choosing their own value of the eligibility variable so that they can become eligible. Okay. Now let's just think about that intuitively, right? So going back to the logic of regression discontinuity, the whole idea is that the people right above and the people right below the cutoff are comparable. Okay. But if people are sorting across the cutoff, that means if people are choosing where they fall, then the logic would no longer hold. I would have no reason to think that people above and below the threshold are comparable because there are some people who used to be above the threshold who are intentionally choosing to move themselves to being below the threshold. And once you have people choosing whether they're eligible or not, you lose randomization. It's no longer random. It no longer mimics randomization. It no longer um, is similar to randomization. Because when people are choosing, you know that the people who choose to move below the cutoff are different than the people that chose not to move below the cutoff for some reason. And therefore, uh, we will have lost uh, that, 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 that uh, mimicking of randomization. No longer will the people just above and just below the cutoff be comparable on average. Okay, so those are the assumptions, and that's the intuition behind the assumptions. Now, let's talk about uh, how we can validate these assumptions. All right, so validating the assumptions. Validating assumption number one. Uh, the most straightforward and perhaps intuitive way would be to graph uh, other observable continuous variables um, against the um, the eligibility variable. So basically, I just I have a very similar graph to the one I presented above, except I'm now assuming that it's this is a continuous variable rather than the outcome variable, and I and I do a scatter plot and I look to see if there is a cutoff. A discontinuity at the cutoff. And so if I see graphs like this, that would support assumption number one. And if I see graphs like this, that would not support. So that would suggest that assumption one does not hold. Okay. So that's a graphical way. That's a that's a graphical way of doing it. Um, sometimes it is hard, and perhaps maybe even oftentimes it is hard to read scatter plots and, and really kind of tell whether or not there's a discontinuity. So uh, we can use a couple other methods as well. Um, so, so with the graphing method, you would have to produce scatter plots of a bunch of different continuous variables. Uh, one thing you could do is, is you could try to condense it into one graph by regressing your outcome variable onto, uh, you know, you write a regression model of your outcome variable regressed on a bunch of the independent variables and then um, predict y hat, so predict the value of the outcome variable and then graph that against the eligibility variable. That would be a way of, um, of kind of consolidating all of the continuous variables into one graph. Okay, but that's still a graph. It's still a scatter plot. It still can be difficult to see. So one thing I like to do is use a it's a regression model um, alternative. Well, what you can do is you can regress observable covariates, so observable continuous covariates um, on the eligibility variable, 
uh, on a, I should say, an eligibility dummy variable. I'm calling this E, where E equals 1 if you are eligible and E equals 0 if you are not. Okay, And a function controlling for the eligibility uh, variable. And so this would be uh, S minus S star. Okay, so you'd run this regression, and if you find that beta 1 is insignificant, that would, um, that would be a way of validating assumption 1. Okay, that would suggest that there is not a discontinuity at, uh, at the eligibility cutoff. Okay, now, validating assumption 2. All right, so assumption two is that there's no sorting at the cutoff. So one thing you can do here is you can graph the empirical distribution of the eligibility variable. You could use something like a kernel density function, or you could use a histogram. Uh, and you're going to look for clustering around the cutoff. You're going to see, you're, you're going to look, do you see it? Do you see a big jump in, in density right before the cutoff and a big dip in density right after the cutoff? If you see clustering around the cutoff, that would invalidate assumption number two. If you don't see that, that would lend support. And so, um, so here in this graph, this would be an example of, um, of a distribution of the eligibility variable that would uh, support the assumption. There's no big changes in the distribution at the cutoff. And this would be an example of, of, of sorting across the cutoff or clustering. What you see here is there's a big jump in density right before the cutoff and a dip in density right after. And so if you see that, that would indicate to you that they're sorting. That means people know that this program is coming, they know what it takes to be eligible, and they are intentionally choosing to position themselves, uh, or at least some people are intentionally choosing to position themselves um, so that they can be eligible. And that would invalidate the method. Okay, now with, um, with all of that said, so we've done kind of a diagnostic and we've looked at the assumptions and we validated the assumptions. Now let's turn to uh, implementing this in practice. So to implement this in practice, we need to go back and we need to make this distinction that I alluded to earlier. Uh, and that is we need to distinguish between what is called sharp and fuzzy regression discontinuity. Okay, so there are two different uh, types of regression discontinuity. There is sharp and there's fuzzy. Okay, and they imply slight differences in the econometric method that we'll use. Okay, so first, sharp regression discontinuity. So sharp regression discontinuity is when there is perfect compliance with the eligibility cutoff. So sharp regression discontinuity is when there's perfect compliance with the eligibility cutoff. That means, okay, so let's just say, let's just assume that we have some eligibility variable S um, and then there's an eligibility cutoff S star. And let's assume that if you fall below S star, uh, that implies that you're eligible. So this would be like the income example where if you fall below $50,000 a year, you receive some unconditional cash transfer. Okay, that's just an assumption. All right, so let's say that's the case. Perfect compliance with the eligibility cutoff would say that anyone who is eligible necessarily receives the intervention. And everyone who is ineligible necessarily does not receive the intervention. So that would say that if S is below S star, you're guaranteed to receive the intervention. And if your S is above S star, you're guaranteed to not receive the intervention. So that is perfect compliance. Perfect compliance with the eligibility criteria. Okay, that might remind us to the randomization lecture where we talked about imperfect compliance. Um, in that context, we talked about imperfect compliance uh, with the assignment, with the randomized assignment of the intervention. This is a very similar concept. Instead of compliance with the randomized assignment of the intervention, here it's the compliance with the arbitrarily set eligibility cutoff. Okay, so that's sharp regression discontinuity. Fuzzy regression discontinuity is simply when there is imperfect compliance. So that is fuzzy regression, uh, fuzzy regression discontinuity is when being eligible increases the probability of receiving the intervention. 
and being ineligible reduces the probability of receiving the intervention, but it does not guarantee it, right? So if I'm eligible, I am more likely to receive the intervention, but I'm not guaranteed to receive the intervention. For example, I might be eligible, but I might choose to not receive it, okay? And if I am ineligible, I am less likely to receive the intervention, but maybe there's some way I still could. Okay, so that is fuzzy regression discontinuity. Fuzzy regression discontinuity is basically when we have imperfect compliance with the eligibility cutoff. And sharp and fuzzy imply slight differences in the econometric methods that we'll use. Okay, so let's look at a regression model for sharp regression discontinuity first. So there's actually a number of different ways to implement regression discontinuity in practice. I'm going to look at really just kind of the most straightforward uh, way of implementing it in a regression context. There are, um, like I said, there are some more sophisticated ways of implementing this, which are just going to be outside of the scope of this course. Um, but um, I, can make avail I can make resources available um, to you for learning some of the more uh, some maybe some of the richer ways of, of implementing it. Okay, but here is a straightforward way to estimate a regression discontinuity um, uh, model in practice. Okay, so here's just a very simple model. Here's uh, we have a model outcome variable y, uh, and then what we do is we include s the uh, eligibility variable that is the variable th that the continuous variable that is used to evaluate um, whether or not someone is eligible and then we use this variable e this, el this uh, eligibility variable e is a um, uh, is a variable that equals one if they are eligible and zero otherwise okay and then we can include other control variables. So I just I have x here uh, to indicate some other control variable, and then you know plus dot 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 to suggest that you could include other control variables as well. But the but the really important point to look at here is is you include the eligibility variable or the uh, um, the selection variable, or the running variable, whatever word we want to use, and then we have this variable e, which defines who is and who is not eligible. And if you remember, for sharp regression discontinuity, anyone who is eligible actually does receive the intervention. Anyone who is not eligible does not receive the intervention. Okay, so in this context, if the, if the assumptions hold, and if the conditions are such that we are able to use a regression discontinuity model and we, and, and we validated the assumptions, um, the coefficient estimate beta 2, so the coefficient estimate on this variable e, will give us an unbiased estimate of the causal impact of the intervention uh, on the outcome variable y. So it's actually quite straightforward, uh, so long as those assumptions in the context hold. Now for fuzzy regression discontinuity, uh, so for fuzzy regression discontinuity, this variable e does not perfectly determine who receives the intervention. So for fuzzy regression discontinuity, we have this variable e, and we also have some variable t. So I mean, I'll just call it t. Uh, so let's define t as a, var as a binary variable that equals one if uh, an individual received the intervention and zero otherwise. Now what we wanna know is the impact of the intervention. So we might, I'll call it the naive model, uh, we might be tempted to use a model where we uh, you know, have our outcome variable y as a dependent variable and um, you know, we have S, so we have our eligibility variable here, and then we just use T. And this would be our, you know, our, our variable of interest. We might, we might be tempted to do this because T defines who receives the intervention and who doesn't. But the problem in the context of fuzzy regression discontinuity is that, is that um, people are choosing whether or not they partake whether or not they receive this intervention or whether or not they participate with it. And because people are choosing it, those that choose to use it are, going, are not going to be comparable to those that choose not to. So uh, if we ran this model, we would know that T would be endogenous. Uh, T would be correlated with the error term. We'd have omitted variable bias. Okay. So what we can do is use E as an instrumental variable for T. Okay. 
we can go back to the instrumental variable approach, use a two-stage least squares model, and use E as our instrumental variable for T. Okay, so we can even think back. We can think back to the uh, instrumental variable um, method and think back to the assumptions of the instrumental variable method and kind of confirm for ourselves that this makes sense. So let's do that real quick. The instrumental variable method um, has three assumptions, relevance, um, independence, and exclusion restriction, right? Okay, relevance is that the instrumental variable uh, should be highly correlated with, with who receives the intervention, okay? Would that hold here? So E defines who's eligible and who's not. T defines who receives it. We would expect that those who are eligible are much more likely to receive the intervention, and those who are um, not eligible are much less likely to receive the intervention. And so I think relevance would hold. Rele relevance would hold strongly here. All right, the second is independence. Now, the idea behind regression discontinuity, as long as the assumptions of regression discontinuity hold, is that E, while controlling for S as well, E should satisfy independence. What do I mean by that? What I'm saying here is that those who are right above and those who are right below the arbitrarily set eligibility cutoff are comparable. It's mimicking randomization. It's mimicking independence. So E should be independent and should satisfy that second assumption. And then third, the exclusion restriction. The exclusion restriction says that the instrumental variable should not have a direct effect on the outcome. The only way that the instrumental variable could affect the outcome is through the intervention itself, right? So here, this definitely holds. The eligibility criteria itself has no impact on the outcome variable. The only way that the eligibility criteria has some impact on the outcome variable is because it affects who might receive the intervention. So, E, this variable E, equals 1 if you're eligible, 0 otherwise. This variable E can act as an instrumental variable, satisfies all three conditions of an instrumental variable. It can act as an instrumental variable to solve the endogeneity problem that we have here. So, we use a two-stage least squares model where we first, in the first stage, regress this variable T onto S and E and other control variables if we have them, all right? Then we predict a value of T and we use that in the second stage. So the second stage has the outcome variable Y regressed on S and then uh, the predicted value of T. And in this case, beta two, uh, our estimated value of beta two will give us an estimate of the causal impact of the intervention on Y. Okay, so to use this, of course, we need those two assumptions for regression discontinuity to hold. As long as those two assumptions hold, then E will satisfy the conditions of an instrumental variable and allow us to use this method. Okay, now I need to go a little bit deeper before we go to this data uh, tutorial. We'll, we'll demo this. We'll demo this in this data, but I got to go a little deeper first. Okay, so far in this lecture, all the examples that I've given, uh, the images that I've given, uh, so far I've assumed that the relationship between the outcome variable Y and the eligibility variable S is linear. Okay, so far I've assumed that. That is that Y is increase is an increasing function of S, or it could be a decreasing function of S. Okay, and oftentimes that is true. Oftentimes that is the case. So uh, so far it's uh, you know been a been a somewhat reasonable assumption, but I've assumed that so far. But that might not always be the case. It could be that the relationship between the outcome variable Y and the eligibility variable S is not linear. So here would be an example. This would be a cubic relationship where the value, at, value Y goes up initially and then goes down and then goes back up. Okay, so it's possible that there could be a nonlinear relationship between Y and S. And if there is a nonlinear relationship, we have to account for that in our method. So notice here, we had a linear relationship between Y and S, and therefore, and that linear relationship 
main it continued to exist after the program was implemented and so there's this cutoff in the middle or there's this uh, there's a uh, discontinuity in the linear relationship at the cutoff so you can see there's a we maintain in, in 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 general we maintain the linear relationship but there's this discontinuity at the cutoff that same thing will hold if there is a nonlinear relationship that is, this nonlinear relationship might hold in general, but there's a discontinuity in that nonlinear relationship, and we need to account for that. And so what we will do is when we, when we do our, our estimation, our regression model, we have to account for the nature of the relationship between Y and S. Previously, when we assumed a nonlinear, or when we assumed a simple linear relationship, that was embedded in the regression. That is, the relationship between y and s was linear. It was just linear in the regression model. That is, we just have s, and beta is capturing the slope, the slope of the relationship between y and s. Okay, but if there's a nonlinear relationship, our regression needs to account for that. And so, we need to account for that by including a nonlinear function of s in the regression. So in this example, the relationship is a cubic relationship. And so we will include s, s squared, and s cubed. Now, this function of s is capturing the non, this, so this um, nonlinear function of the eligibility variable, this function is now capturing the accurate, uh, capturing the relationship between y and s. And we have to control for that. We have to get that relationship right. If we don't get that relationship right, we're not going to estimate the difference at the cutoff correctly. So um, it's just a small adaptation that we have to, to keep in mind. And typically what we'll do is we'll use a scatter plot to try to uh, determine the general shape of the relationship between the outcome variable and the eligibility variable. Okay, and so we will include that for sharp and for fuzzy. So for fuzzy regression discontinuity, we'll include that uh, in the first and second stages. Okay, with that, let's practice this in Stata. Okay, so here we are uh, in Stata. So now, in Stata, we are going to um, uh, we're going to do an example. We're actually we're going to do two examples that will allow us uh, to practice using the regression discontinuity uh, approach. Okay, so here I have a data set, and um, I've kind of embedded two examples into this data set, two contexts. So let's take a look at them. So so here we go. Um, impact of, so, so example number one, what we're going to do is we want to look at the impact of an unconditional cash transfer on time children spend studying. And so let's just say, let's say we're, we're doing this in the context of, uh, of a developing country, uh, but an urban area of a developing country. We want to improve um, educational outcomes in a developing country. Um, in, the urban, in an urban area of a developing country where uh, most students attend school, but oftentimes, especially for lower income households, um, children oftentimes have to help their parents work to, to generate more income for the family. And so um, we think that we can improve educational outcomes if we provide a cash transfer to households that, that, um, that are low income. And if we do that, we think that then those families might be able to allow their children to spend more time studying and less time working. Okay, And we think that that'll help uh, improve educational outcomes. So that's the rationale. And so let's say that that program was implemented. And the program, so let's just say it was automatic. This transfer was provided automatically to any household with wages less than or equal to 30 Ghana CDs um, per, let's say, per hour. Okay. So that's the context. Now, based on that description, just based on the simple description of the scenario, would we think that this is fuzzy or sharp? We always have to think about that. Um, it is one of the first things we, th we should think about. Now, based on the description, um, I think uh, it will be sharp because it says that it will provide it automatically. But let's confirm it. 
So let's confirm that assumption. So what we can do here is we can generate a variable. I'll call it e, which corresponds to what I defined it in the, in the lecture. And I'm going to say e will equal 1 if they're eligible and equal 0 otherwise. And so the eligibility cutoff is 30. And we're saying that you're eligible if you make less than or equal to 30. Uh, so wave wage in the data set here. So I'm going to create a variable e and equals 1 if they're eligible and 0 otherwise. OK. Now, I have a variable in the data set UCT, unconditional cash transfer. It equals 1 if the worker received it. So that's already in the data set. We have data on that. So let's just do this. I'll do tab UCT E. So I'm just going to look. Is there any evidence of imperfect compliance? So here we go. Uh, for those that are eligible, everyone receives it. For those that are ineligible, no one receives it. So that confirms it. We have sharp regression discontinuity here. OK, now, is this going to be a good method? Now, OK, it's already clear this program is implemented based on a, um, an eligibility criteria defined on a continuous variable. Wages is a continuous variable. And there is an arbitrarily set cutoff at 30. So we know that's in place. We know this. Uh, we know that this context um, allows for us to use regression discontinuity. That is, it's possible to use it. But let's see. Uh, do we think it'll work? Do we think it'll be a good method? Do we think? Do we see it? Do we find evidence of it in the data? Uh, so let's just do a quick scut a scatter plot of study time, the outcome variable, and wage, the um, the eligibility variable. And so now that cutoff is at 30, so that 30 is here. And so if we go through here, can we see any discontinuities? Can we see any discontinuities here? I would say I would say I think so. It does look like there's a little bit of a shift in the in the density uh, upwards right below the cutoff compared to uh, above the cutoff. Now that's hard to see, and like I said before, this is this this can be kind of tricky. Um, but it looks like there is uh, a discontinuity there, maybe a slight discontinuity. So I'm going to say that this looks good. Um, now also look into the scatter plot. Can we say uh, is there a linear or nonlinear relationship here? And if it's nonlinear, um, what kind of relationship is it? So when I look at this, it again, it can be a little bit tough because we're assuming this data comes after the program's implemented. And so the shape of this scatter plot might be a result of the intervention rather than some underlying relationship. But with that said, it does look like there's a nonlinearity here. It does look like there's a little bit of a downward trend at first and then a little bit of an upward trend later. And so that makes me think that we should include, uh, that makes me think that this is nonlinear. And it makes me think that we should include uh, s and s squared. Now, of course, in our case, that is wage, because so s is that um, is that eligibility variable. So uh, wage and wage squared. Okay. So I want to capture that nonlinearity, and it looks like it it looks like it's kind of a U shape, um, and so we can capture that with a simple um, quadratic function where we've wage and wage squared. Okay, so we've done a little bit of a diagnostic there. We, we kind of have an understanding of the relationship between, between um, study time and wage, between Y and S. Um, and we feel confident that uh, this, this, this method might bear us some fruit. So let's go ahead and run it. So, uh, oh, sorry, actually, uh, we need to validate the assumptions first. So what are the two assumptions? So remember, assumption one is cont uh, continuity at cutoff. So that is continuity for other continuous variables. So uh, let's do that. I'm going to use the, the version of this that I like, which uh, takes continuous variables and regresses it on E, as well as this function um, of, of the eligibility variable. So I'll do gen. Um, okay, 
which is going to be wage minus 30. Okay, so let's run that. All right, and then now I'm just going to do this regression. And I'll do this for several different continuous, uh, other continuous variables in the data set. We have household size, that's continuous. We have experience, that's continuous. We have, um, what else? We have education, that's continuous. So let's run these three and see what we have. So what we're looking for here is to see whether or not that E variable is significant. If it's significant, that suggests a discontinuity. If it's not significant, it suggests um, continuity at the cutoff. So here we go. Uh, e is insignificant, so that would suggest that education is continuous at the cutoff. All right, here, insignificant, so that would suggest that experience is continuous at the cutoff. And then here, again, insignificant, that would suggest that household size is continuous at the cutoff. This all supports, uh, this uh, all supports assumption one. So this all suggests, it all suggests that uh, the cutoff is arbitrary. Okay, now can we validate assumption number two? So for assumption number two, we're looking to see, is there any evidence that people are sorting across the cutoff? Is there any evidence that you know, for this one, some people are trying to reduce their wages so that they become eligible for the program. So we can do this a couple of different ways. Uh, we can we can do a smooth empirical distribution with a kernel density function, um, or we can we can break it up uh, using a, a histogram. Uh, both are fine. Let's do let's do the histogram first. So we're looking at thirty. Now, one thing you'll find sometimes is you really kind of want to zoom in on the cutoff point. Uh, and so sometimes you might restrict the space that you're looking at. So I'm going to do that here. If wage is, uh, let's say, less than or equal to 40 and wage greater than equal to 20. So let's just kind of zoom in um, so we get a better idea of this. So here's 30. Okay, so do we have any evidence? And I'm not necessarily going to look just to the to right above and below, but I'll look a few columns um, below, above and below on the histogram. And in general, looking at this, I would say that there is not a lot of evidence of sorting. Um, yes, this is a little bit higher than this, but it's very small. Um, we have three very similar weights here. We have a little bit more weight here. I don't see a lot of sorting here. I could even change the window that I'm looking at to see if um, to see if I see any other evidence, but I I really I don't see. So here's 30. So here from this, for, so zooming in differently here, I don't see evidence of sorting across the cutoff. I don't see some big jump right above or right below the cutoff. I don't see evidence of 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 sorting. So no evidence of sorting. So in conclusion, we validate the assumptions. Assumptions, let's proceed. All right, so let's do the analysis. If we validate the assumptions, let's do the analysis. Now, this is sharp regression discontinuity. It's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, we're just going to do a straightforward regression. We've got study time as our uh, outcome variable. We need this E variable. We need wage. Now we said that we thought the relationship was nonlinear, so we need to create a variable uh, wage squared. All right, so let's create that, and we'll include that in our model. Now we can include other control variables as well, but we don't necessarily need to, so I'm not going to for the purposes of this demo. Um, do you want to control for heteroskedasticity? So let's put robust there. All right, so let's run these. Okay, here we go. So we have um, E, it is statistically significant. Uh, what this results, what it looks like it's saying is that um, for those that received the intervention, uh, their children have 4.6 more hours of study time per week than those that did not. And so this, uh, this program, uh, 
or I should say, uh, actually, let me let me rephrase that. Given that all of our assumptions hold, we can actually look at that coefficient and interpret it causally. We can say that this unconditional cash transfer caused a 4.6 hour per week increase um, uh, in the time that the children spent studying. Okay. All right, so that is our illustration of sharp regression discontinuity um, and the first example. Now let's take a look at the second example. I'm going to use the same data set here. Uh, except I'm going to I'm going to drop the variables that we created so that we can um, uh, so we can uh, create them again. All right, so scenario number two here. Uh, so let's say we are trying to improve wages uh, for um, for workers. Let's let's just use our same context. Let's say we're we're back in Ghana and we want to increase wages uh, for Ghanaian workers. And so we think we can do that pro by providing them with the soft skills training, um, communication skills, professional skills, presentation skills, etc. And so what we do is we want to offer this training. But we only want to offer it to people that have lower levels of education. We really want to implement a program that helps those um, that have lower levels of education to start with. And so what we do is we do we provide free training offered to anyone with less than 12 years of schooling. Okay, so anyone that has less than 12 years of schooling. All right, now, based just on this description, do you think this is sharp or fuzzy? Based on the description, because we're saying free training offered to anyone, that sounds to me like people get to choose whether or not they're going to participate. That suggests fuzzy to me. But let's confirm. Generate a variable e. It equals 1 if they're eligible and 0 otherwise. So um, people are eligible if they have less than 12 years of schooling. So I'll generate a variable e that does that. All right. And then I'll do tab E, and then we already have a variable in the data set training equals 1 if they receive the training. So let's calculate this. Okay, we can see that uh, for those that are eligible, not everyone received the training. And for those that are not eligible, some of them did receive the training. So this is, this is uh, going to be fuzzy regression discontinuity. Okay, so what we're saying is being eligible increases the probability of receiving the uh, intervention, the training, uh, but it doesn't guarantee it. So this is a fuzzy regression discontinuity. All right, now let's do a scatter plot. Do we think this is even going to be a good method? So we'll scatter plot wages versus uh, education. The cutoff is at 12, so it's right here. If we look at that, that's pretty tough, actually. It's not obvious. It is not obvious. There might be a little shift upward right below the cutoff. We have, we have some density coming up here. Actually, we have maybe some outliers, but even if we don't look at the outliers and we look right here, uh, it does look like the density shifts up a little bit uh, right below the cutoff. And so that might suggest to me that, um, that we do have evidence for a cutoff um, at the threshold. Okay, so so this looks good to me. Um, it is hard to detect, so it's not super obvious, but I would say this looks good to me. I would still proceed. Now, but looking at this, do we see do we see any evidence of there being a linear uh, or nonlinear relationship? Well, again, this one's pretty tough. Um, it's hard to say if there's a consistent upward trend. It sure seems like there's an upward trend from, let's say, six years of schooling. But below six years of schooling, it almost looks like a downward trend. So I think here we could probably justify saying it's linear or we could justify saying it's a quadratic. I'm going to go ahead and say linear because this downward trend just isn't super strong. So I'm going to go ahead and say that this is linear, even though I admit that it's a little, it's a little tough to say. So um, I'm going to say uh, this looks good. And uh, I'm going to say that linear relationship. All right, so now let's look at the assumptions. Assumption number one. All right, uh, 
continuous, continuous at the cutoff. All right, so first I'm going to generate that, uh, that function. So I'll do education minus 12. All right, oops, I'll create that variable. And then I'm going to run those regressions again. We'll do reg. Okay, continuous variables, household size, that's one. Use E, S, robust. All right, and I'm just going to run this for uh, different continuous variables. All right, experience is continuous. Uh, let's see, study time is continuous. All right, so let's run those. All right, so study time is, insig is significant. So that would suggest to me that, that would suggest to me that this is not going to hold, okay? All right, so that means study time is not continuous at the cutoff. All right, what about the others? All right, the other two are continuous at the cutoff. Household size is continuous at the cutoff. Experience is continuous at the cutoff. But study time is not continuous at the cutoff. So, so conclusion, ah, sorry, do not validate assumption one. Let's see, assumption one. Okay, now let's just go ahead and look at assumption two for the sake of practice. All right, let's do this histogram for the education variable and let's restrict it. All right, if education is, let's say, below uh, 16 and education is greater than, let's say, six. All right, so let's see. Do we see any evidence of sorting across the cutoff? All right, the threshold here is at 12. There does seem to be quite a bit of density below 12 and less above 12. Now, this is a little bit difficult because it's hard to imagine that anyone, I mean, people can't reduce the amount of education that they have. They can't change how much education they've received in the past. You could imagine someone dropping out of school in order to gain access to the training. Um, and so it is possible for there to be sorting. It does look like there's a little bit of extra density below uh, the cutoff. So this one's a little bit, this one's a little bit unclear. It's a little bit of a hard context, actually. Um, so let's say this one's unclear. Now, let's take these two combined. Let's look at the results we have for the two assumptions combined. What do we conclude? I would say we do not we do not validate the assumptions. Now, let's review what that means and let's just use this as a way of kind of practicing. The whole idea behind assumption 1 is that the cutoff should be arbitrary. The cutoff should be arbitrary. The cutoff is some value on a continuous variable, and so the cutoff should be arbitrary. Now, if it is truly arbitrary, then you will not find discontinuities at the cutoff for any other of the variables, for any other continuous variables, because it's arbitrary. And so people right above and right below should be similar. Now, this example is kind of tricky right from the start because 12 years of schooling, that's a high school degree. People that just graduate high school and people that don't just graduate high school, they actually might be quite different. And so I'm not too surprised that I don't validate assumption one here because of the context. Okay. And likewise, that carries over into assumption two. Assumption two is that there's no sorting across the cutoff. There's not people choosing. Well, it's a little bit hard for us to be able to observe that because in the sample already, because because 12 years of schooling is, is, a, is a big break point for schooling, it's not uh, surprising to me that it's hard for me to be able to notice. It's hard for me to know whether or not they're sorting across the cutoff. And so taken together, we don't validate the assumptions here. That's a sobering conclusion. We have to, we have to be able to see what does that look like, right? And so we see it right here. 
all else being equal, this context seems like it's one that is suitable to regression discontinuity because the training is offered to people based on uh, some eligibility criteria defined on a continuous variable. So it seems like it would be a great option. But if we dig down into the details, the, the threshold is not necessarily arbitrary. Even though it is, a, it is a particular value defined on a continuous variable, it's not necessarily arbitrary. And so it's not surprising to me that we don't validate assumption we don't validate assumption one, and it's not surprising to me that assumption two is difficult to validate. And so taken together, we would say this method is not going to be an effective method. We don't validate the assumptions. Okay. So in practice, I might stop here, but for the purposes of illustration, let's go ahead and proceed. Let's just um, temporarily. Temp uh, temporarily, all right, I don't know how to spell, but that's all right. Temporarily uh, proceed, uh, assuming it works. Assuming validity for the sake of illustration. All right, so let's just go ahead and proceed for the sake of illustration. All right. Now, in practice, we wouldn't proceed at this point because we haven't validated the assumptions. Um, but let's just proceed for the sake of illustration. Now, the idea with fuzzy regression discontinuity is that if the assumptions of regression discontinuity hold, this E variable will satisfy the conditions of an instrumental variable, and we can use it as an instrumental variable. And so we would use it um, in just that way. So we'd use IV reg 2 here in SATA, um, wage is our outcome variable, education, uh, that is our eligibility variable. It's a, it is the continuous variable that defines, um, that is used to determine eligibility. So I'll use that here, I include that. Training is the endogenous variable. So I have to regress that on education as well as the variable E, and then point out that training is the endogenous variable. So let's run that. And what do we find? So here we get an estimate of the impact of the training on wages. Now this is not the training variable itself, it's the estimated training variable based on the two stage three squares model, okay? And so if the assumptions of regression discontinuity held here, I would say that the training um, caused an increase of 14 Ghana CDs per hour in wages. That's how I would conclude this. Uh, that's what I would conclude from this. But I know that the assumptions do not hold, and therefore um, this, is, this is just a correlation. I cannot conclude causation from this. Okay, and so that completes the demo for regression discontinuity. I really appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed this final lecture of the class. Uh, I hope you have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you in class.